Welcome to the UN House. Uh, Happy New Year. One of the, I'm sure so many of you had Happy New Years, right? I think it started already in December and it's still ongoing. So, welcome also from my side, as, as Suraj said, on behalf of the resident coordinator who's currently on holiday, on my behalf as part of UNICEF. Um, and very happy, by the way, to see so many young people here. So, it's really very special and gives a lot of positive energy. So for those who are new, um, it's a concept that was started with Loan Foundation. It happened three times already. It's an open space that we are creating in the UN House where we want to exchange with, with leaders, change makers. The objective is to listen, to discuss uh, important subjects for the country um, on social progress, on development. And the theme today, that's why you're here, is developing villages and migrating to towns which I think is very relevant and actually stimulated my thinking as well. When I thought about migration, I had this vision of you know, early human mankind. Uh, we all migrated at one, at one stage and no one would be in this room without human migration. So it really goes back to the beginning of time. And I also thought about, is it positive or negative? And of course, it can have a lot of negative implications. It can lead to decline of population in rural areas, it can lead to conflict bec between communities about land. But I think it has a lot of positive implications as well. You know, migration can, can drive urbanization, can drive innovation in cities, it can bring economies of scale, which improves medical services, education, it can bring cultural progress. So, so there, there are always two sides to it. And it's global, it's happening everywhere almost. I'm from Germany, and as you may have seen in the news, it's a big topic in, in Europe as well, migration. But it's very relevant for Bhutan, and that's what we will discuss today. So I have a lot of questions. What's the situation in the country? What are the factors? What are the implications? <coughs> what will the future bring? So I hope you know we will get um, stimulating discussions and, and questions and answers. So I'm really looking forward to the discussion. First, of course, let me introduce our guest speaker, um, who may not need no introduction, of course. I mean, you are very well known. Om Jimmy Panambongdi, the Secretary General of Tarayana. So it's a pleasure to have you. And what I didn't know, you're a horticulturist by profession. <laughs> <laughs> I hope the flower arrangement is okay in the back. <laughs> and you have worked in many various capacities in the Ministry of Agriculture before then being seconded to head Tarayana in 2005. And you are also on several boards, I learned, Royal University, Royal Institute of Management, Bhutan Transparency Initiative, so these are very important functions. You're also a member of the Least Developed Country Independent Expert Group and, and have worked closely with the UN, including with UNICEF, of course. And I was very impressed also personally when I visited Tariana supported projects in the rural areas, so I have a high respect for the work of Tariana. You have university degrees from the US, Thailand, and India, so quite global as well. And our host, who may also need a lot of introduction, but just to say, Karma Funzo, you studied Buddhism in Bhutan and India, mm -hmm. um, have university degrees from England, and worked as a researcher in France and England. You have founded the Loden Foundation to promote education and entrepreneurship, and we as UNICEF are also collaborating, so we are very privileged to also work with Loden Foundation. And you have published a number of books, translations, reviews, and articles on Buddhism, Bhutan, and Tibetan studies. When I look at all these credentials, I feel very small. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I guess I will stop talking now. So it's a pleasure to have you. And with all of this, I'll hand over to the host. Thank you for joining us. This is the fourth session of Bhutan Dialogues, and the first one in 2018. Um, this forum we hope to be a space for civil conversations to mainly reevaluate our own assumptions of development and progress, to sort of refine our understanding of what we are doing, perhaps update on certain issues, um, and also ask bold questions about the past we have come from, the present that we are living, the future that we will be uh, going towards. It's a, it's a great, great honor for us to have you because you have been a, um, an exceptional Buddhist woman, female leader, especially engaged in development. 
and you have seen, I think, during the course of your working life, the social, political, cultural transformation Bhutan has gone through. So one of the questions that we always ask our guests is also to tell us your story. What made you who you are right now? Were there some specific personal experiences that triggered you on your path? How did you turn into a development CSO leader from a horticulturist, for instance? So uh, please share with us uh, your own story and to give us some sort of, uh, interesting insights into what changed you to, to make you who you are. Because we here normally have a lot of young audience, and what we are really hoping to uh, do is also give the young minds a role model to follow. And I think for lots of young Bhutanese, you are a very good role model. Thank you, Doctor. I think that's a very generous introduction. I do think I deserve that. <coughs> Having said that also, um, as a Bhutanese, I think uh, we are privileged in many ways that we had uh, education opportunities when we did. And uh, I keep telling all the young people who pass through my office, I keep telling them that they have to just take up, seize up on any opportunity that comes by. And don't just think it's uh, this is good, that is not so good. The good and bad is made up in our mind. If you apply yourself to any situation and make the best of it, that turns out to be good. In my own case, of course, I was literally driven by my mother. Uh, who didn't get uh, school education herself, but she had the privilege of having studied a little bit of uh, smattering of Hindi and a little bit of Dzongkha. So she was taught her to read and write in our own context, but I guess there was a yearning for education uh, as far as my mother is concerned. I'm the oldest of six children. All of us were goaded into taking, going and doing our best in whatever field. At least academically, she said you had to do study as much as you could. So when I completed my class 10, my aunts, my dad's sisters turned around and said, well, you're a girl. I think you've had enough education. Uh, there are these nice boys in our neighborhood. Maybe you should uh, you know, get married and settle down. My mother took one look at me, and she shook her head in the background. So she shook her head and said, no, you're going to go and study as much as you can. And that choice is yours. So I, mean, I guess it's with these small nuances and guidance that uh, is provided, timely uh, support from family members in the initial years. And of course, uh, that's exactly what I went and did. Uh, my mother was keen that I study medicine. But she was sort of not a very strong constitution, didn't keep very good health. So she felt that uh, there are many women like her who would need support from a doctor. So I took one look at her and said, I can't stand the sight of blood. <laughs> I feel giddy when I see sick people, too many sick people. You know? So I don't think I'm cut out to be a doctor, but my mom wouldn't hear anything of it. So I just took up science and did whatever, you know, to class 12. And after that, I did a nice uh, uh, reversal. And, and I said, see, if you can keep people healthy, you study, and this thing was uh, with uh, Tasha Lampenjo, he said, our country desperately needs horticulturists. I didn't know what a horticulturist was at that point in time, so I looked it up in the dictionary, and it says someone who works in, with flowers and fruits and sort of, you know, I said, okay, that's good. Flowers are beautiful, fruits you can eat. So if you're working in a field that uh, provides healthy food, that's a good start. So I was quite convinced that this was something I could do. So I went and I convinced my mother, not really convinced also, she wasn't convinced actually, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but I told her, see, I would rather that our country have enough food, good fruits, uh, so that people are healthy and they don't need to go and see a doctor. So maybe that's my life's agenda. It was, that's how I went into this uh, horticulture field. But uh, having said that, I was the first technical uh, uh, horticulturist with a four-year degree from India uh, and it was at a time when there were not that many women in the technical areas so I remember still remember the first annual conference that uh, I attended where the minister uh, introduced and the minister said well you know it was, uh, it was time for lunch and they were announcing lunch 
lady and gentleman. Mm. <laughs> that, that was the scenario. <laughs> it was, it's uh, not ladies and gentlemen, it's just lady and gentleman. And so, but Bhutan is such a place that even being a single person, you still, if you did your work diligently, you were given the space to plan out your activities and carry it through and succeed at them. So when kids these days, the young girls who come in and say, oh, because we're girls, we don't get this or that, I'm a bit worried because I don't know where that is coming from because that didn't happen during our generation. I think um, there was a lot of rough talk in office and things like that, but if you gave it back in kind, then you were left alone. So sort of you learned the tricks of how to stay focused on what you needed to do, and uh, that's important. So what took you from a highly specialized profession of being a horticulturist to become the Secretary General of Tarayana? <laughs> well, a royal command, maybe. <laughs> no, but jokes aside, uh, my work was always, uh, even as an agriculturist or a horticulturist working in the agriculture sector, you were engaging with farmers and you were working with the grassroots. So my work didn't mean that I was sitting at the table and chair office work, it meant interacting with the farmers on a personal level and then finding out first time what their needs and requirements were. And the more I engaged in that area, I realized the limitations of how a sectorial approach uh, could add sectorial blinkers and they weren't talking to each other, there were all sorts of silos. It's the same farming community, the same population uh, that we were targeting, but then forestry would come and say, okay, you have this land, why don't you turn it into a social forest or something like that. Then livestock would come and say, convert that into pasture and grow, uh, raise cattle. You know, so the messages were all very mixed. And <coughs> also very, we would think that rural uh, farmers are not intelligent or clever. And that's our biggest mistake. Because they've survived on the land for centuries. And they know better than most of us who just come back with book knowledge and think we know we have all the answers. Uh, so they're clever. They take your program, the horticulturist program, everyone's program. In the end, they don't do much work, but they've taken all of the, you know, the projects and they said they'll deliver on those projects. But maybe uh, they don't necessarily do that. So the impact, the positive impact that should have come with all of the input. Uh, it wasn't coming in. So when we dig in a little deeper, we realize that the message is all mixed. The integrated approach would be something that needed to happen. So in the Ministry of Agriculture, we worked very hard in trying to get that integration going. Uh, and it was around that time when Her Majesty, in her capacity as the patron for agriculture, the r, &R sector, and the environment sector, uh, uh, the royal children were all out uh, studying in colleges, and so there was a little time. And Her Majesty trekked to many of the rural areas personally to get a first hand experience of what uh, life in these remote corners were like. Uh, she didn't believe us when we told her about, you know, but we have all those in reports. So, well, the reports are one thing, but I have to see for myself. And so that. Uh, started sometime in 1998-99 and got really uh, active in 2000. And so uh, that initial period uh, where we were trying to figure out how do we then link what's required on the ground with what the government can deliver. And that's when the foundation, the Tarayana Foundation, the seeds were sown for the foundation. But it wasn't until 2003 when the foundation was officially launched at that time, I was head, uh, heading the policy and uh, planning division of the Ministry of Agriculture, a job that was already uh, quite uh, uh, tedious. Because you're responsible for a very large sector and then responsible to, if we are in an agrarian country, so definitely a large number of people were dependent on decisions from that office also. So, the initial three, two years or so uh, as a volunteer at Tarayana, you know, had my full-time work, then came home and did the volunteer work and then something had to give. And the giving, of course, uh, it was easier to give up the government uh, job and move on to Tarayana because the service platform of Tarayana is such that you can actually connect with the needs of the rural, uh, rural people. 
and try and uh, deliver. It's more like UN delivering as one. Because the, the needs on the ground are integrated. And so if there was any platform that provided that, it was Narayana at that point in time. Now, of course, we have quite a lot of other civil society organizations also trying to help. And that's a good thing. So um, it's a wonderful thing that uh, uh, Narayana started and you uh, took this integrated approach to development, especially in rural areas, uh, through Narayana. But it's also rather sad that uh, instead of changing the main public uh, engagement with the rural communities, you know, making the public institutions change for an integrated approach rather than this distributed silo approach, um, was the public institution, the bureaucracy, too difficult to deal with to change their system into a holistic one? Not exactly, because I mean, the agriculture, if you look at the history of how agriculture in the country has evolved, the ministry, the departments, how it has evolved over time, we tried the integrated approach, then it, it depended so much on the leadership of the time. And so with each change in the leadership, the entire system just the, uh, you know, uh, disintegrated or coalesced together. So it wasn't necessarily a structural system that was fixed. It was more uh, personal, personal uh, driven by personal commitments and, uh, uh, I don't know, as a civil, uh, having been a civil servant, I'm still listed as a civil servant, so uh, it gets a bit tricky when people are territorial about who gets to do what and no one wants to step on each other's toes, and so sort of they're kind of not necessarily uh, sp speaking frankly and freely and trying to see who would be best suited to help uh, reach services in, in these last nine years. Look, uh, you raised a very important uh, question in development, and that is really coordination of efforts. It sounds like we still lack in having a sort of unified, uh, coordinated effort to address issues. And that's partly the reason why we are also having this forum, that we need people to come together and discuss issues, to uh, thrash out the issues and challenges. Um, what is your perspective on this thing? Are the public and the NGO and even the private uh, agents of change not coordinating enough, not uh, adopting a multidisciplinary approach to development, but rather working on their own in silos, using just a one sort of single approach. Do we need to have more of such discussion and consultation? Uh, or are we doing too much talking and not doing enough? <laughs> uh, yes to all of the <laughs> <laughs> can't multiple, yes to both. <laughs> multiple choice questions. It's like partially true on all fronts. No? Mm -hmm. We are doing a lot more talking than is necessary. Mm -hmm. Action on the ground seems to be quite uh, different from the commitments on paper. We have a lot of very good policies that are you know, lingering on the draw somewhere in the, for the lack of resources to implement it. If you have a policy instrument, then who are the identified policy upholders and who are the enforcers? How are those policies then translated into action? So while we have a lot of very good uh, policies, I think our government has done a wonderful job of uh, taking the best from everywhere and trying to uh, make it adapted in a manner that befits the business condition and our context. So in that regard, we have some of the world's best and most progressive policies um, it's just a matter of now finding the resources to set up institutions that can then implement those policies and carry them through. And, and, and those are things that cannot be done by individuals or cannot be done by uh, as, as dedicated an organization as we are, very passionate social workers. It's not our job and not our mandate in the first place. So I have said that also we can contribute and we can uh, show by example very quietly, silently, in the rural areas, bringing about uh, change. And then we show them by doing that it can be done for a, a fraction of the cost that uh, the government might have uh, assumed it would cost. We're able to deliver services to the satisfaction of our uh, end users. So when those things come about, now for instance, just recently, we uh, Tariana was uh, working in collaboration with the government on two projects, the NAFA uh, to the second phase two of NAFA uh, and uh, REAP to 
So the, the evaluations are going on at the moment. Uh, JNHC and uh, the director, the, the program coordinators, program officers, they've been into the fields where Darren was implementing these. And so slowly, <coughs> rather than us trying to convince them that we can do it, we do it and we say, okay, then during the evaluation phase, they can see for themselves. The results are there on the ground. They interview, get to talk with the people and say, okay, you've done this much, but if you had a little bit more resources, it could have gone a little deeper. You know, so things like that come about only through the um, uh, <coughs> for the evaluators, it's experiential. Uh, they have to feel it. They have to um, uh, really buy into this concept that uh, it isn't about just having the money or the resource to get things done. It's also a lot to do with commitment. And that's what uh, uh, the recent findings, I think they're quite happy. Uh, we are fortunate that they're happy. Uh, so we hope that next phase uh, and will be engaged as well. <laughs> that's yet to be seen. So let's go to the uh, grassroots uh, energy nation. What is the current scenario of the Bhutanese country, the rural uh, countryside? We get a, a lot of impressions that people are uh, deserting the villages, that some villages are having as much as 60, 70 percent of the houses vacant, a lot of young people coming to the urban uh, settlements. So what is life really like? Can we get a more accurate picture of what the uh, wishes, the aspirations of the rural people would be, you are always engaged with them. So what is your take on this? Are they very pessimistic about the future or very optimistic? Not really. They, they are a hard working group. And the youth in, in, involved also. Very engaged in the well-being of their own community. So <coughs> we've worked very hard in trying to inspire young people you know, to seek out a role for themselves in their own community, to see how they can be useful in the community through our Tarana, uh, the volunteer, the school club program, through uh, volunteer engagement programs. So these are slowly being, being off. After 15 years, we've suddenly seen a lot of young people interested in rural development. And they're asking questions. They're asking the right questions. They're asking uh, politicians about how what changes they're going to bring and whether they you know the community has been taken on board and they're asking questions during meetings. And this constant need to know and seek answers I think is also something that young people can do better. Because the older generation grew up at a time when they just did what they were told more or less or didn't do. They listened and then didn't do anything about it. So uh, we are at this task where uh, young people are slowly beginning to figure out for themselves that if they are active in the community, they are respected and regarded by their own people. And that's a big boost to their confidence. And if they can serve their own community, then, then they say, why can't, you know, why can I not serve a little further afield? Mm -hmm. So that confidence grows and that's a, it's a good uh, opportunity for young people enthusiastic uh, social workers or agents of change to uh, find their own grounding. Uh, with regards to the deserted villages, Tarayan is currently working in close to about 350 villages and we've not come across any deserted villages because we are working in the most remote and the most uh, uh, economically disadvantaged communities. That scenario is also changing very rapidly. In the last 15 years or so, so many of these villages, once deemed remote, are now connected by motor roads. The, the, the telephone connectivity has expanded. This uh, internet facilities have expanded. So once they're connected, they don't feel that remoteness anymore. They don't feel that they're on their own. They feel that at a call of, uh, you know, at the, at the touch of uh, their phone, they can connect with government agencies, service providers, with their suppliers. So it doesn't feel as if uh, the country is as remote, you know, the communities are as remote as they once used to be. But having said that, I understand this question coming in this, that a lot of uh, larger villages in the East that have been deserted over time. And it's not desertion per se, uh, in search of uh, jobs or things like that. That first wave of educated people 
came and worked in government in various portfolios and, set, and came to Tempo along with the, the government jobs that they had and they, they settled down here. They didn't go back. The aging parents then came and joined them for the, you know, the, the end of life uh, experiences well with their children. And so that's how houses got left behind. Uh, if it was something that could move, I'm sure they would have moved it with them. But uh, having said that, we have several proposals on how these villages could be revived, or how these villages could be uh, uh, shared with those who are still in the community and might not have decent dwellings, might not have decent uh, living, maybe turn these into uh, guest houses, homestays. There's so many uh, options of how we could use uh, these infrastructure that is already, because these are fairly the well-to-do uh, families who haven't gone back. Because their kids and their grandchildren, <laughs> I don't think they, they see uh, the need to go back and live in those houses. But in the communities where Tarayana has worked, they've never really owned a home. They're just living in you know, small one-room thatched uh, huts that uh, over time uh, they've now converted, they've worked hard um, and Tarayana mobilized them, provided a little bit of uh, a push and a pull uh, and sort of helped them with their permits and helped them with the land registration and things like that, the technical aspects of it. And now that they have proper homes, they shouldn't want to come back. They have restrooms. They said, okay, it's not as bad. And uh, they have better living uh, situations and better food uh, in the rural areas, in their own villages, than they have here sharing a one-room flat uh, or, or you know, taking rooms and sharing with multiple friends and struggling in their search for a better opportunity. And suddenly something goes about clicks and they say, well, life in the village, if we can find something useful to do. And then particularly in the areas where Narayana is working, they come back to assist in, or take part in the programs that we've set up. And so they are now running uh, quite a lot of these self-help groups and also the micro-enterprises that are coming up in the village. So long as we can give them some uh, tasks, some responsibilities. Mm, you brought up a very important cultural um, issue for me, the issue of self-esteem and dignity to have a dignified, esteemed life in the village itself. And it seems there are many factors contributing to that, uh, things like communication, facilities, uh, living standards, of course, and proper houses. What are the other things? I mean, this is a very important topic that if we were to encourage people to remain in the rural communities, which is, I think, very important for the overall economic development, cultural um, stability and so forth, then we need to really think through carefully, rigorously, on what are the different factors that make young people find that self-esteem and dignity in living in a village. So it seems that I know such an institution work there. But we still know from the uh, reports, particularly the recent uh, poverty analysis report 2017, that rural poverty is still much higher than urban poverty. So if people were going to have poor lives living in the villages, it is quite natural that they would opt to come to an urban settlement. Uh, what are the main issues you think that we should deal with? How can the public sector, the NGOs, engage in order to eliminate poverty? It's a very good question. I think uh, UNDP is asking that globally as well. <laughs> but uh, coming down to, I mean, in our own uh, scenario, um, there's another interesting development that's happening in the rural areas. There are lots of retirees, well-educated, respected retirees, who are now opting and choosing to go back to their villages. <coughs> Earlier, it used to be that they would settle down in Tempo or in the vicinity and don't go back to their roots. Now, if you ask uh, civil servants who are retiring or from the armed forces who are retiring, they all the first option is that they will go back to their own communities. In order to 
you know, this, that this conversation, we should, if we had asked the same question about 10 years ago, the answer would be quite different. Mm -hmm. Now we have this big pool of people, experienced people, who can go back and be leaders in their community. Mm -hmm. And that gives us a lot more um, optimism in how this trend of migration, young people have to exper experiment and experience, and they should come to the cities, add new, uh, this, bring in their enthusiasm and uh, their uh, stamina and strength in new and budding startups. That's only natural. The world over, that's what drives, like you mentioned, you know, the entire, uh, uh, the entire yeah, the, the, that's what drives it. But that does not mean they're packing up long stock and barrel and coming. They just look for a green, you know, a good opportunity, go and seize that opportunity, make some money, and then they want to come back and be invested in their community. And that's how it should be. So now the, the more important question is, if we as older citizens can show that, lead that trend of going back to our roots and supporting causes back uh, home, Shyamla would be a very rich place by now. Mm. We have some of the top-notch, uh, you know, politicians or government bureaucrats or in the armed forces. Lots of people from Shyamla. Mm. But uh, in the past, there was no actual input back into the roots, and therefore Shyamla remained uh, pretty mm. distant uh, from Timbuk. If you look at every second or third individual we talk about in influential people, their roots are uh, from Shemlon, somehow connected to Shemlon. So the, just a reminder, I just threw in Shemlon as an example, but mm -hmm. I mean that is true for... It's a good example, I think, because it is considered as one of the poorest on cults in the country, with many successful citizens uh, living outside of the district. Um, that, that, that being, that's also very true, but this is, that is, I mean, again, when you talk about poverty, there's the different tones to poverty. You talk about, um, the, if you're talking about economic poverty, I don't know whether Shemlon would fall under that, because the opportunities are endless there. It's just that the, the potential is there, no one's there to tap it. And no one's there because they're all outside. In both uh, the case of uh, people going back to their original homes, or, um, and also the case of uh, the engagement of development agents in the communities. One thing that strikes me is the uh, cultural notion. Now, culturally, Bhutanese are very um, sort of connected to their <coughs> original homes. They have a strong sense of belonging to the land, the uh, ancestral home. And the same way, when we engage with these rural communities, where you have a very strong cultural system, a cultural structure in place, development agents often fail to see the cultural sort of nuances. And some of our projects get, of course, um, I mean, they fail because of the lack of cultural understanding. So in both these areas, is there more work that we need to do to leverage the cultural uh, understanding, the cultural Practices. Uh, definitely, definitely, and uh, this brings to mind uh, the one particular project that uh, Tarena is trying to uh, design <coughs> together with the community in Changbi. Uh, this was in our early days, and we were quite excited. We finally managed to find uh, a small uh, fund, small do uh, donation, and we thought we could get started with this uh, particular project, and then to leave which was designed entirely by the community themselves, and sort of that was a crop they knew they, they were familiar with and they wanted to do it. And yet when we, Tarayana sent our two field officers who had been sent to India to learn how to do the processing and the weaving of it, and uh, went back to the village, but they were adamant they didn't want it. And this is happening from an NGO that we pride ourselves at being able to understand the uh, social nuances of our communities. And they called me, because the nearest uh, telephone was two hours walk from where they were. We went to the roadhead and they called the office and they said, well, but uh, the community here now doesn't want this project. And uh, so I said, uh, who did you talk to? So we talked to the elders, we talked to uh, the, the members who actually designed the project. 
talk to everybody. I said, they don't want it. I said, did they tell you the reason? They did. There was no reason given, they just didn't want it. So uh, I told my two officers to just wait, stay there in the, um, there's a small, uh, small town uh, at that road and so stay there and see what happens over the next few days, keep me informed. Those days the, connection, the connectivity was also pretty bad. <laughs> and this about the third day they had the community, the, uh, you know, because it's a small place, they knew that there were two people here from Narayana and they had this project which that now, uh, which the original planned uh, community didn't want. So this is a nettle, nettle uh, project, yes. nettle to, to make fabric out of it. So this other community, uh, they came forward and they said they want it, they're equally poor, but because they were not on our list of uh, the, the community, the entire process had been done with uh, a different community, uh, they were wondering, now what do we do? Is this community who has expressed interest and they would like to take this up? And so what do we do? So I said, go through the norms. Go check out the uh, resource base, uh, do a survey, do the whole thing. So they stayed there for two weeks, did all of that, and they said, we were convinced that that uh, community genuinely wanted uh, that project. So within two weeks, or by the third week, the project was handed over to them. And But I was still very puzzled, and I wanted to get to the bottom of why this first uh, community didn't want the project. So I requested uh, uh, my sister who was here on the break at that time, who was, uh, was an archaeologist with a, a social anthropology sort of uh, combination. So I requested her, we were doing another survey, and I requested her, can you go and talk to the community, find out what went wrong. So for a very simple, uh, you know, she is, uh, submitted a two-pager, which she's still annoyed about because we didn't do anything with it. <laughs> He kind of very silently uh, ignored her findings. But I mean, the, but that was a big lesson uh, for the foundation. This is it. Earlier taxes that the community paid was paid in metal uh, ropes and fabric. And that association of that um, was something they didn't want to, you know, they didn't want a project that associated metal weaving with. They didn't see it that way, they just thought was it was a cultural a more stigma associated with metal tax? I don't think it was cultural stigma, but maybe it was difficult at that time, and that all of that went as taxes, so they didn't get to keep anything, so maybe they thought, okay, we're going to leave this fabric, then they didn't make the cash connect at that time. So they don't Tarana is another form of so oh, modernized netto taxi. <laughs> uh, maybe, uh, but, um, but it was very interesting that two pages that find the finding that uh, ultimately surfaced was something so simplistic that we had overlooked. And we knew that was uh, what, what you know, they were good at, and they were paying most of the, of the taxes and that. But I mean, it was simple norms, and we have an organization, a local organization. So imagine how much harder you know, foreigners who come and as uh, development advisors or as uh, uh, program coordinators, how much harder they have to work in trying to figure out what's going on. When they say yes, it doesn't always mean yes, and when they say no, sometimes it doesn't always mean no. So, uh, in the cultural context, I think there's still a lot of uh, work that still needs to be done, and consultation is a good form of starting. But um, in the initial years also, they will tell you what they think you want to hear and not necessarily what is how they feel. Or, so no, now, after so many years of gaining their trust and their confidence, so much easier, we get letters and we get requests from quite a lot of different communities asking for our services in their areas uh, where you know, we can do only what we can with the limited resources, both human as well as financial. So. Uh, uh, it's uh, refreshing to know that you take into account the cultural um, sensitivities of the people. As I've been lately reading about uh, how terribly Red Cross failed in Haiti and how billions of dollars have been misused. Um, now, coming back to the work you do, um, you have been working for many decades almost in elevation of poverty. 
and uh, Tarayana has done wonderful work in the rural communities. But then with the growing urban population, uh, we seem to also have a significant urban poverty from the latest uh, poverty figures. I think they're around 800,000 out of 100,000 uh, residents say, in Thimpu who are not meeting the, the poverty line. 200, sorry, 2,195 new jumps per month. Is there any initiative uh, within Tarayana or by the government? Should there be strategic ways to cope with urban poverty? Because I think the urban poverty, in a way, is causing more social problems than rural poverty. A lot of our rural villages still have a very strong social support system in place, whereas our urban settlements are new and we don't have the social support system to look after. That's, that's true. This is an emerging issue uh, that didn't necessarily receive a lot of uh, attention both from the government as well as uh, and from Tariana. We are focused on rural development. But uh, over the years, we've also noticed that a lot of our rural, uh, maybe semi somewhat well-to-do rural children migrate to urban areas and they said if they do not land a good job then they are hard pressed into difficult times and uh, rather than write home and you know try and get some uh, support from home they try to make things work in the uh, in the book and they can't go home because then they don't have anything to take with them and they can't stay on here because there's uh, really no job that they'd like uh, but to say, to say that there is no job is a misnomer. I think uh, there's still plenty of uh, job opportunities. It's just that what our children look for when they see a job is quite different. The expectation of a job is different. And that mindset we need to change, be able to change. Because if you're flexible, there are opportunities. But uh, having said that, also urban poverty is a bit masked. If you walk through town, you don't really know who's going hungry. You don't know who, is, um, who hasn't had their breakfast or their lunch, or is it fashionable and they're not eating. We don't know that. And there is no monitor. If it is in the rural areas, the entire village knows what's going on in each other's homes. If they don't have enough to eat, people come and help out and sort of, you know, if you have something extra, you go in. And there's no, this is constant give and take that's happening in the rural areas because it's the entire community working together. Whereas uh, you're correct in saying that in Tempo, very often you don't know our next door neighbors, particularly if you're living in flats, but they're changing, uh, the, the turnover is quite rapid, rents keep increasing, people can't afford their shift. So there's a lot of things going on that's quite different from what we're used to. So I would term these as new um, uh, issues that warrants better coordinated effort at um, STEM. I'm particularly concerned about young girls and young women who come to either for their jobs or for their high schools, come and stay and have uh, um, the accommodation is not safe uh, or they have to make do with having to live together with their uh, lots of friends, not very conducive to uh, their study habits and patterns. So there are lots of concerns actually, and a lot more coordinated approach, uh, a better coordinated approach would help solve uh, some of these particular different See, for example, the girls hostel, uh, the supervised affordable housing for young women who are starting uh, their first jobs, maybe. So there, there are lots of uh, safeguards that we could put in place, but then whose job is it? Any yes. plans for Tarek? <laughs> <laughs> we have our hands full with the rural development at the moment. I wish I would hit the New York jackpot or something like that, and then maybe we could have uh, you know, a better uh, uh, coordinated approach. Also, there's, there's not enough dialogue happening in urban areas of how to tackle these issues. If neighborhoods are not safe, then it is upon the uh, people living in that area to make it safe. And how do they uh, make it safe? Not by shutting their doors, but then going out into the streets and helping each other, and sort of really creating a closer neighborhood uh, system uh, that's currently lacking. 
and uh, I mean, like, yeah, I'm as guilty as the next person with what you don't know, and you try to put some sort of a, a protective shield uh, so that you are not caught up in uh, this sort of uh, having to deal with so much of uh, yeah, issues. I mean, I'm, of course, having worked at Tarayana, the issues follow me too, Tarayana, so uh, we do hear of uh, quite a lot of things that could be done better, more e efficiently. Uh, we have started uh, with the waste uh, uh, from there to try and make products and for single mothers or women to try and get some additional income. So in small ways, we're trying to see how we can provide our holistic uh, approach to uh, people uh, who might need uh, a little bit of a uh, push uh, in, in the urban areas. So before I open to questions from the audience, uh, this is a ritual of Bhutan Dialogues. We also ask our guests to share uh, a couple, maybe a few tips on how you keep on top of everything. How do you succeed um, in your position with your role? Uh, what are the kind of tips you can share with young people to, to succeed in life? Yes, there are, um, everything is very relative. The energy you put behind it, any goal you set for yourself is also relative to your desire for that to be fulfilled. So if you want something really bad, you have to work hard, put in that hard work. The magic world, I mean, you call it luck, you call it uh, whatever, uh, good fortune, all of that is hard work. No. Good fortune follows hard work. Luck follows hard work. But hard work, in the sense that uh, you're working smart, not necessarily, uh, uh, how, how would you long hours. Yeah, Working <laughs> long hours, I wouldn't equate uh, it to be hard. Mentally, you have to be alert. So your discipline is absolutely uh, crucial, particularly for the younger generation. If you're disciplined, if you're hardworking, then you shouldn't have to worry about uh, you know how and when you're going to achieve what you have to achieve. It will follow you. Um, fortune favors those who go out there and sort of stick out the neck. And you don't have to be a conformist in every kind of you know, scenario, situation. If you're different, celebrate it because that's who you are. <coughs> if you think differently from the rest of uh, your friends, that's also important because these differences, then, but you need to be able to, you have to agree to disagree, right? So then you can have a more enriched, uh, enriching dialogue. Right now, we think that if you say yes to everything that uh, someone you feel is superior or uh, senior to you, and then you just say yes to everything, then that's how you get the job done. That isn't necessarily the case. You have a live example of someone who's been saying no to many things. Definitely, if you, if you can validate your own feelings and you can explain it, articulate how you feel, what it is that you want the world around you to be like. You have to be able to visualize it, and, uh, you know, articulate it, and say it out loud. And then stand by it. But unless you're convinced, then you don't make those, you know, take those opposing stands. But once you've taken those stands, then you stand by that. Good evening, everyone. My respected sir and doctor, madam. I have three questions. Uh, before that, I'll introduce myself. Uh, my name is Uttam, and currently I'm doing intern at Gautin Foundation, and I'm from Sherapsi College. As a youth myself, uh, working in different uh, or uh, different youth-led organization, I have seen that there are many uh, activities that are overlapping. Example like uh, example like if uh, NGO like if Tara and is a youth is working on cleaning campaign. Another one, maybe like Bhutan Youth Foundation, they are also working on. So there's a overlap in the in same activities where they are they are working in like same same thing. They are doing the same thing. So at times I feel that there's uh, there's sometimes there is lack of uh, credibility as well. Although we are doing for the welfare of the people, but there is some we we no, don't know who is doing what. So one question is, uh, 
the question is that how uh, are you as a uh, you know leader of one of the NGO? How are you going to tackle this problem? And another one is uh, I, <coughs> I'm on the learning stage, so I, I always um, see I always try to learn from the failures. So I would like to uh, hear from you about well, Tara, Tara and I was. Uh, implementing various programs, what are the challenges you see? Oh, one you said about the, you know, uh, putting trust on the people. One may be that one, but what are the other things that challenges in uh, implementing your programs? And another one is like, <laughs> I'm from Futsoli, so I, uh, I, I do shopping in Indian side, Jagam, so I most of the time see that there are beggars. And when I come to Thimpu, I was surprised that there are also beggars in Thimpu, Bhutan. So I was a bit you know, surprised about this. Maybe they are not beggars or whatever, I, I don't know, but <laughs> they are found to be begging in the street. So is, is there any new plans or is there any new things that you are going to uh, take into consideration about this issue? Thank you. And especially this beggars are not the one uh, uh, those are mostly old people, <laughs> and, and when I ask when I ask about them, they they always tell them, they have, they always tell about their rich, you know, background. <laughs> <laughs> so what is your <laughs> plan on this? Thank you. Come for your three questions um, uh, regarding the begging beggars and and the backwards uh, the beggars. I know of. I know of three of them. One unfortunately passed away this morning. Uh, we'll be creating him tomorrow, so that's uh, one. But these are not actually beggars in the true classical sense of not having anything. They are lonely, oldest citizens who feel that if they have a little bit extra money, these are on the on His Majesty's Kidu list already, and His Majesty provides a stipend through the Kidu uh, program. They are already provided stipend, monthly stipend, so they don't necessarily need to be out there begging. But it's this interaction when you sit and you stop and you chat with them, so that human interaction that they lack. And uh, although uh, Bhutan is a Buddhist country by and large, and we are compassionate people. We don't necessarily have sufficient time for the senior citizens or for people who are in those sort of conditions. Everyone's rushing by to get their jobs done. So uh, I personally sit and I talk to these people uh, at the Chetan also, who are senior citizens. These are parents of rich bureaucrats who sit there and they like that company, they like that social uh, milling around. I have Angezam who still insists on sitting at the vegetable market. There are people who know her, but she's been sitting there for like uh, X number of days. So she's saying hello to them, bye to them, you know. And then in return, they give her vegetables, she takes them. She doesn't need all those vegetables. She's living by herself. How much vegetables can she eat? But when she goes and distributes those, to other people. So it's also a way of social panic. Now maybe Bhutan is ready for yet another controversial topic of uh, uh, senior citizen care, old age homes, or hospices. For the gentleman who passed away this morning, uh, he's almost 90 years old. Uh, he's had no, uh, no, no one visiting him, no one uh, you know, providing him with care. A very, very difficult old gentleman. Uh, one can imagine his village uh, also the not very supportive of him. This he spent his youth not in his community but outside, and so he has lost that connect with this community. He is more he feels more connected to Tempo and the life in Tempo. But uh, like you say, they talk about the rich uh, um, beginnings and you know the, the conditions. Well, that's a circle of life. You, there's nothing guaranteed and change is the only thing that is permanent. So uh, there, there are issues. These are senior citizen issues which uh, 
through a more coordinated effort initiated. We have um, uh, lots of organizations now who are trying to gear into uh, taking care of such issues. Taran is not necessarily, uh, that's not our focus here at the moment. And we hope we won't have to do that because there are others who are better qualified to look after senior uh, long-term care for senior citizens and things like that. On the issue of hospices and uh, old, old age homes, um, Bhutan prides ourselves, or we used to pride ourselves in that we are a country that takes care of our young as well as our old. But uh, in this day and age, I think there are lots of uh, lonely, senior citizens who could do with a lot more care. So for, for what Tarana is doing at the moment, we connect some of these senior citizens with uh, uh, Tarana school clubs. So the school club members go and visit them or go and uh, see them if they're in the hospital, go wash their clothes, clean up their space and things like that. But there's very little you can actually do uh, if you're a difficult person and don't want anyone touching your you know, coming into your living area or touching. So then, uh, trying to clean up, then we get reports in and someone's come to try and steal everything of mine. <laughs> so, so when they're difficult, it's, it's extremely difficult. This particular um, gentleman used to be a very difficult individual as well. But, uh, on the challenges, it's uh, resources. Mostly resources. If we had more, we could hire more people and therefore uh, deliver our services more efficiently. You were talking about trust. For Tariana, trust is very important. Because our Tariana colleagues, our field officers, have to function so far away from Timbo and is on the basis of trust. We uh, work together with the community, build the confidence. The, the community has to have faith in what this individual is going to do. And this individual has to have the faith and keep that faith also in serving the community. So if we start to, beginning to, you know, if you can identify and empathize and be one with the community, then that is possible. If you see yourself <coughs> as an outsider, you'll always be that. So the first lesson all our field officers have to do is really embed themselves in the community. <coughs> start and be and think and work as one of them. So that's, uh, regarding overlaps, that's true. Now that we are from 50, 52 registered <coughs> sources, uh, activities tend to overlap, but um, there are areas of specification. Let's like say, for instance, Tariana is working in rural area, mostly focusing on holistic rural development. That's our speciality. But because we are in such rural areas, there's nobody who will come and do cleaning campaigns. And by the way, Tarana does not do cleaning campaigns. We believe in trying to educate people or educate people to clean, to pick up after themselves, clean up after themselves. So that we, I don't think it's the youth. This is my personal belief that I don't think uh, youth or the bureaucrats or for that matter, we should be going around cleaning up uh, the trash of others. We have to provide enough civic sense into every citizen so that they're cleaning up their own trash, that they're not uh, throwing people wherever they like or spitting wherever they like. You know? So that level of work, we, we hope we can achieve it you know, sometime soon, but uh, it's still the work in progress. I hope I've covered uh, I think we did uh, discuss uh, integrated approach, coordination, and this is still a um, pertinent issue to be raised often, not only among the NGOs, but also with the, between the public and the private sector, between the NGOs and the government. I feel that personally uh, we, all, we have a tendency to use a very broad brush when we talk about urbanization and migration. So, uh, and then we also seem to have a tendency to uh, romanticize village life. So um, I was thinking perhaps the attention could be more on uh, rural urban linkages. Uh, you know, so my question is, how could we perhaps make, uh, perhaps have better linkages between rural urban areas so that one benefits from the other, rather than talking about uh, trying to stop migration or 
you know, building artificial boundaries between urban and rural areas, especially in a context like Bhutan where we don't have the mega cities, but we're talking about towns, small towns, <coughs> smaller towns, <coughs> and maybe one or two big towns. Right? That's my question. Definitely. Uh, rural urban connect is what we have to all uh, hope for, achieve, work towards. I think that is uh, key. Because if you know where your roads are and if you can reinvest into developing that at the same time as uh, you develop your career or you develop your businesses, letting it grow, if you can think of how your business can benefit the rural areas, for instance, the raw materials are a little bit more expensive if you procure it locally, but if it brings about when you talk about uh, the economics of happiness, I think that was the discussion a couple of uh, months ago. They were talking, touching upon issues like this of uh, sourcing raw material from one area, finished products going in as raw materials in the next village. So what are the designs, in, uh, what are the uh, product designs that can lend itself into this instead of just being uh, uh, if you look at it purely from an economic point of view, maybe it does not, uh, that's not the best option. But because it will benefit uh, growth at multiple levels, both in the urban areas as well as in rural areas, and what are, sort of, what are the possibilities. So if we can train ourselves to think along those lines, if we can look at options that are not necessarily only linear, but look at it, uh, from all points of view and sort of see which can uh, get you better net return, taking into consideration job creation, uh, use of raw material, natural environment uh, protection, all of that. If you look at it and sort of, so what uh, Tashi has uh, pointed out, uh, it's, it's very pertinent and it is the need of the art. We are definitely not uh, uh, only city or only uh, uh, rural areas. We are sort of <coughs> people who move between these two, and opportunities lie in both areas. There's a lot of uh, natural resources in the rural areas that could be tapped efficiently, ethically, legally. Because right now, what's happening, uh, we don't know whether everything uh, is uh, without. Uh, the full consent or the full awareness of what the potentials are for by the local communities themselves being exploited by other people who are uh, more educated or better informed, then it creates further imbalances. So uh, preventing those sort of uh, exploitation by looking at what can benefit uh, both businesses as well as uh, the resource providers. I think we have a lot of potential there. Coordinated effort is required. And uh, as Dr. <coughs> pointed out about the need for better coordination, I think uh, the JNHC has also, uh, in their guidelines for the 12th plan, this came across very, very strongly. This is one of the three C's, right? And so we are expected to uh, work more collaboratively in a better coordinated fashion. So uh, we, are kind of, we, we look forward to. Seeing these words being implemented. Um, if I may chip in a little bit on this issue of linkages between rural villages and uh, urban <coughs> settlers, um, certainly we need the, uh, the physical infrastructure uh, to do that. Uh, that helps a great deal, as you pointed out. But there's one very specific Bhutanese thing that's happening, and that is the uh, village associations that are mostly based in urban areas, like Kimpo, the, the Barsam Sopa, the Bidun Sopa, the Gradin Sopa, almost all the major villages are represented here. And in fact, a lot of us actually have closer friends and family members here from the original village with whom we mix, uh, who we would meet for funerals or weddings or whatever, more than our office colleagues or uh, next door neighbor. And I think this is a very unique opportunity that we can actually build these associations to help their original villages to develop. And I must thank Helvetas for extending your support beyond the registered CSOs to even community-based organizations. And I think this is the way forward, especially to create the social linkage 
that if you support the village groups here to carry out projects in their own village, we should be giving them financial resources, other kinds of resources to take their part. And they will be the most committed to do that, much more than an NGO worker or a bureaucrat from another village. First, rather a perspective uh, and maybe uh, a question. Uh, and, uh, listening to the issue of old age, so I sense a kind of, and of course, seeing some, meeting some people in Tempo, so I sense we are, uh, I sense we are losing our values of Pambushi, Chimsandare, and not knowing neighborhood in our own, uh, living in the same house, uh, same building. So these are kind of a telling evidences of how our communities are involved. Of course, we cannot really reverse the trend, but then how do we really incorporate as we progress on? And uh, and the other trend is as uh, young people preferring urban and of course coupled with the school choices and preferences. So as we learn, uh, study and get exposure, so what we are losing is the cultural grounding. So when we do not have the, that cultural root, then we do not really uh, identify with the cause and the issues of our own community. And that, I think that uh, largely is with how our schooling system is. So I wish uh, there were some uh, officer from Ministry of Education here, so that my views are So what I see as an option is the school kind of school setting. So to pick from uh, doctor as mentioned about village-based association. So I'm into my third year in civil service. So my circle of kind of a network is more of school friends than village-based associations. So how can our school really foster that kind of a community living? Thank you. An interesting uh, question is about values. Value is something you cannot literally shove down anyone's throat. As we evolve, it's up to each individual to pick and choose how they want to shape up as uh, citizens, global citizens that we are now. Uh, in that respect, I think parents, my, at least my parents used to drum it into us, uh, what's right and what's wrong and things like that. Now, if I took that same method and tried to instill it in my son, it would have misfired. So we have to each generation pick and choose uh, how we communicate values and the ethical uh, uh, and, and pass that uh, value system down to the next generation. I, I believe very strongly that my generation we feel quite miserably constrained that there are so many people who are confused as to what is right and what's wrong. Now, if you look at a global trend. We seem to start, you know, with now, but we have also started valuing wealth more than they value um, uh, other aspects of development. Mm, if you look at how the world measures a successful person is by the bottom line, you look at who are the richest in the world, these are the exploiters of, uh, you know, I mean, how have they amassed that much wealth? They exploited nature, exploited people, maybe created jobs, but uh, uh, so when these are then branded as successful, by that maybe that big global setup. Now if you look at it from a smaller uh, Bhutanese lens, we are also starting to brand successful people as those who drive around big uh, vehicles or who own multiple homes and things like that. So yes, there is definitely an erosion of what we used to consider important in a, in a generation um, that's different from yours, or if you are from the next generation. So for each generation, I think we have to have uh, enough sounding rules as to what, what it is that you want. It comes back to the question of earlier, I was saying you have to visualize the world that you want for yourself. And in that visualization, values have to continue to play an important role. Otherwise, then you're choosing, you know, we would be no different. We, we are in this land of uh, G and H. Uh, so we have that development philosophy as a guide. But uh, how much of that is lip service and how much of it is uh, truly from your heart that you make a daily effort and daily um, strive 
towards meeting those goals of happiness, not just for yourself, but for everyone. <coughs> If you can, uh, I think the doctor is more qualified to talk on values than I am. So <laughs> I'm a social this worker. This is a very complex topic, so <laughs> let me not get into it. But Sonam, uh, do you have a very quick question? Short. Yeah. Good is, uh, I got to know why you need to compile the data on the empty house, especially when I was working as a research in other two zones of Intashika and Tashanzila. But uh, in t I, I was we really worried about in Tashkan because as according to the even the UNDP, Tashkan Zong is the highest uh, rate uh, into the migrations. So I, out of uh, 8,000, 8, 10 households in Tashkan districts, uh, 983 households are now in Tonga. And being for me out of, uh, out of 747, uh, 125, to between the 95, out of uh, 32 household, and person 150 out of 462, by the count of 3 Mundo, empty household out of, uh, out of uh, 99 household, mm -hmm. Mupara 57, so and Kaling 66, Lumong 85, Dredi 86, yeah. Samsung. So, can you answer the question? <laughs> <laughs> they have fantastic figures to support what I was earlier saying. Uh, so, when I ask this, uh, uh, what is the main reason for this, uh, they having uh, empty houses? They respond to that, uh, as mentioned, or rightly mentioned earlier. Uh, first, it is school uh, children who go for college education. So once they get job, parents follow them. And the second thing is, uh, uh, generally, parents, parents generally uh, accept, uh, expected to their daughter to marry with someone from urban areas, and their child, child, their son will be employed in the government sector and companies. So that that may that that are the reason why they are left in uh, empty houses in most part of the eastern Bhutan. Yeah. So my question is that uh, as Thailand has uh, walked uh, every nook of the corner of the country to encourage the rural people to uh, to hold back the uh, people in the villages. So other than that, uh, what are the policy or what are the Framework for what are the objectives or plans uh, uh, or have uh, in order to uh, hold or in order to stay the people in the rural area. This is my question. Okay. Do you have that uh, program in these villages? Do you want to respond to the I mean, it's very interesting. Do you know, was there a follow up question as to whether they've settled permanently elsewhere? Like have, have they bought land in Tipu or borrow and settle their own homes? Some of them bought land in the town, and they settle in the town, and some they are going for uh, the baby for their uh, son and children. So, and at the same time, when the communities are, they held some important functions, or even they hold in the local temples, and only the, all, all, only the old people are there looking for the temples. So many, uh, the, uh, the young people are married to uh, other media in order to get some jobs. So, so in this regard, uh, as you have uh, time as you are uh, looking for the uh, people to go, you know, to enhance or encourage the people to set up so many, so many activities in order to, uh, in order to uh, hold, hold in the business. We did not get any requests from these two or three or these uh, communities, many villages. Yeah. many villages that you've mentioned, but uh, Samzonkar, uh, we have touched because of Samzonkar initiative, there, there's already another civil society organization working there, so we haven't touched there. Uh, but in Tashigan, uh, we've gone to Merak and something, but not to the others, uh, only because of uh, resource limitations. But I'm interested in the Kangong one. If there are empty houses and Kangong students, charity students don't have enough housing, mm -hmm. it's a perfect match right there. So, uh, <laughs> I don't think Kangong was in the list. Of <laughs> <laughs> no, Kangong was, 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 was in your list. Yeah. 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 Definitely, there's a lot we could do. There's a lot that needs to be done. But whether it is Tarayana who does it or the local government, 
local governments might be more effective if they have uh, central plans or, or local level plans uh, and budgeted plans uh, to try and entice young people to come back to their villages. Otherwise, so long as this trend continues of them seeing it as life's improvement if they can buy a lot of land elsewhere and settle down there, then maybe what we need to encourage is they sell that piece of property and then it becomes available to somebody who needs it. We have one final question to you, uh, and that is uh, the question that we ask all the guests. Bhutan Dalos offers two titles from the New York uh, bestsellers list. Which two titles did you choose and why? If you have chosen, maybe you have the time to choose. I did, I did. In fact, uh, Lincoln and the Pardo. I thought that was uh, uh, only because it's, it's a fiction, but I thought uh, um, it's, a, it's an award winner and I hadn't read it. I had this opportunity of getting a free book, so why not that to me? That was one. And the other one, I was intrigued by this entire Russia, the, the total, you know, the total, you know, is that the title of the book? Yeah, how Russia is being reclaimed by that. And so um, I thought that you give some insight as to what's happening uh, under Putin. It's just, I try and balance uh, what I read, to try and do a wider uh, research of what I read. So this was another topic that was uh, written by uh, someone who's a award winner. So I thought, since one fiction and one more fiction. Thank you. Um, with that, uh, I would like to thank uh, Amashimi for joining us and all of you. Uh, we like to imagine this place to be a space for mindful listening, for righteous speech, and critical thinking. And I hope this has triggered uh, ideas and thoughts into you. Um, I often wind up by giving you a local, traditional Bhutanese piece of wisdom. Last uh, session, I think I was quoting Chandra Kipri on the importance of wealth as part of human well-being. Today, I thought I will uh, come even more closer to our rural wisdom and uh, something that's very relevant to our forum here. Mirap Chiki, Lorikle, meeting Sungi to Durka. The decision through discussion of three middling persons is better than the idea of the best person. So with that, thank you all and see you next month. <laughs>